What's up friends? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Pam and today we've got a fun little video. I'm going to talk to you about a few different ways that I'm going to be getting more than just like a salad and some mental health perks from my garden because I feel like there's lots and lots of videos on YouTube where we we think of garden planning in the sense of like, oh, what do we eat and what do we want to eat out of our garden and and you know, sometimes we think about things like pollinators and other stuff, but I'm really going to be squeezing a lot of additional joy out of my garden this year. So I wanted to talk to you about some of the ways I'm doing that and maybe it will give you some ideas too. So I'm going off a blog post that I put on my blog last week, which if you didn't know I had one, I do. I just, you know, sometimes I update it, sometimes I don't. <laughs> the link will be down in the description box. I've been thinking a lot about this this year because I've gotten my gardening legs underneath me. And of course you don't need to feel like you're a great professional gardener to start thinking in these terms, but um, it's given me a little bit of mental space to think about other things my garden could be doing for me besides like, you know, the expected. Probably the more expected thing that I'm going to be framing my garden around this year is to make sure that I can do a lot of canning and preserving. Now, that's not necessarily because I think like society is gonna collapse and our food chains are gonna continue to be disrupted because nothing's ever gonna get better because our entire country is run by greedy billionaires that just make all of the laws and everyone's just fine with it for some reason. But it's actually just because I really enjoy making jellies. Pepper jellies, so fun. <laughs> but I did uh, teach myself how to uh, do some beginner preserving last season and I actually had a really good time and I have used everything. I mean, we ate all the pickles already. I'm still working on the hot sauces and pepper jellies, but we've put a really good dent in them. I was able to give a bunch away and my head's been spinning thinking of like how many other things that I can preserve this coming season. And of course that will include freezing, you know, blanching and freezing. Um, for a lot more fresh vegetables, which I did not do last year. I would like to do that this year. And then sort of building off of that, another main focus of my garden that's sort of taking it beyond a salad is that I really love to drink teas, like herbal teas, mint teas, things like that. And I absolutely refuse to pay $5 a box for something that I can very easily grow. Mint is one of the easiest things to grow. In fact, you would be hard pressed once it gets established. It can be a little tricky to get there. But once it gets established, you would be hard pressed to kill mint. In fact, I think when I die, uh, sprigs of mint will sprout from my corpse. So um, every season I grow multiple varieties of mints and basils and lavender, different kinds of flower petals. There are so many things that you can make teas out of. And I'll try to remember to put like some resources and links and stuff in the description box with like books and things like that, that I've learned stuff from. I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll remember, I'm sorry if I don't. Every year I try to grow enough holy basil to take me through the entire winter and spring until it's time to grow some more annual holy basil plants, uh, which is also known as Tulsi. Um, I talk about it on this channel all the time. So this is old news if you've been around. It's my absolute favorite. So this season I'm gonna be growing even more than I grew the year before. And I'm going to really make sure that I do a lot of cutting in the earlier half of the season. Because of course you can take leaves off of plants like this all season long, but I find like all of the spring more tender greens are just the best for drying and making tea. So that's gonna be a big focus this year is working on building up my tea apothecary. I am envisioning mason jars full of tea ingredients and, and all winter long, me just opening them up and being like, mm. I am 40 and you really need to find joy in life at this age. <laughs> the serotonin does not just come to you. You need to work for it. I also make loose incense that you burn on charcoal bricks. It's like just always been my preferred method of um, incense, especially since working at an occult shop when I was 16. Uh, but I've always made my own incense out of resins and herbs. So I like to grow my own herbs for that as well. So I have my teas and my incenses. So I'm gonna be just dry packing a lot of herbs in jars this year. 
So next up on my little list of the extra things that I'm gonna get out of my garden is dried and pressed flowers. I am a big crafter. It, I had to sort of shelve this part of me um, during the earlier years of my kids being, you know, younger and it's just, you know, I was in college and I was working, and kids and school, and there was just no time for crafting whatsoever. And even if I tried to make the time, I would just probably feel guilty or like I was neglecting something else. So for a long time, I just shelved it. But let me tell you, I dried some flowers last year. You can't really see it because the light is just perpetually reflecting on it. Here it is right here. This is um, some pressed flowers in glass and that was so satisfying let me tell you you can also see somewhat right here i just showed this in a video not too long ago i also made a flower crown last year for me and my daughter when we went to see florence and the machine live out of sweet annie and that was making a flower crown out of sweet annie that i grew with little flowers that i had grown all woven through it was so close to a spiritual experience for me <laughs> It sounds dorky, but it brought me so much joy to just like have this really like something that you imagine when you're like a little kid, you know, and, and, and I could just do it. And then it dried really beautifully and it just got me thinking um, as well as my intense desire to grow broom corn and make my own broom. I don't know what is coming over me in my midlife. It just got me thinking of all of the dried things that I could pull out of the garden that would then give me this sort of material to work with over the winter. You know, if you're getting a little bit of the winter blues, you can sit down and make something beautiful out of pressed flowers from the spring or the summer. And that just had my head spinning. I was looking into resin art and, and um, making prints and, and all kinds of things like that. So it was, it was very exciting to think about. So that's another way that I'm gonna be planning and then harvesting and saving my garden for other things besides a salad. Now playing off of the crafting thing, something else that I really would, I'm just dying to get into this year. It, it is happening, we're going on this journey together. I will film it, I will take you with me. You can watch me screw things up so that you don't then do it yourself at least in the same way that I did, I'm going to be growing dye plants. I'm going to be dyeing natural fibers, which if you did not know, I am a knitter and um, I have recently retaught myself to hand spin uh, yarn from a fleece on a drop spindle. So um, I, I can also sew a little bit. I used to sew uh, before I broke my machine and never replaced it. They're very expensive. And I'm I'm dying to get into weaving. So like f fiber arts in general has just been a, a lifelong, I mean, since I was a very young passion for me. So it didn't really dawn on me for some reason until I was planning my garden this year that I could grow plants that make natural dyes that I could then dye the undyed yarn that I spun with my bare freaking hands. <sighs> So cool. So I'm gonna definitely do some more videos on this as I finish researching. I've been, I have like five books that I'm in the middle of right now. So I'm sort of reading a bunch of books, older ones and more current ones. And I'm gonna sort of pull the information together and I'm gonna do some experiments and take you guys with me. But to get you started, I'll put a little list of plants down in the description box that you can actually make natural dyes from. And you can, you know, research from there on your own, but maybe if that's something you're into, that'll be a easy jumping off point for you. So next up is something I have talked about on this channel before, and I will also link another one of my blog posts. Um, it's like a longer thing that I wrote about about this down below, but a big aspect to gardening for me, and this goes far beyond anything I harvest for myself, is that I am trying desperately to give all of the native bees, pollinators, butterflies, you guys know I love monarch butterflies. I work really hard to make sure that I don't plant things that are harmful to natural pollinators. I do not use any sort of pesticides or sprays or anything outside. Um, if I use anything, it is bug barriers, um, maybe soapy water, 
things like that. So um, a lot of times I will rely on companion planting and more natural ways of handling pest control. And that was a very difficult approach for the first few years of gardening. I will totally admit that, you know, there were times that I was really tempted to go out there and just like blast everything down with insecticide. So I admit that that approach was really difficult the first few years because I did not have this established, you know, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Oh no, like a diverse, uh, po you know, population of both pollinators and predator insects, birds, things like that, that, that will naturally handle a lot of your pest pressure in your garden. And it's pretty rare um, that I experience like a total infestation of things anymore. And that's because I put in the work of just just sucking it up through the first few years of not using anything that would harm all of my beneficial insects. So how is that getting something for me beyond the salad? That is actually giving me the salad. It's giving me the salad and then some. If you didn't know, here's a great example. Um, bumblebees, honeybees get all the press in here in the United States and they, they have their place, but they are a livestock you know, thing. They're, they're livestock, basically. We need our native bees even more than we need honeybees. I pay a special attention to my bumblebees. Um, it's great to have all the other native bees too, of course, but bumblebees are obviously really easy to spot because they're like giant puppies. But if you want more bumblebees, a great way to get them is to plant a lot of snapdragons. And because bumblebees are so big and because they collect the pollen by buzzing, by literally vibrating the pollen, um, you know, off of the plant and onto themselves, um, they are one of the only insects that really like pollinate snapdragons because they're able to like elbow their way in there. So if you plant a lot of snapdragons around say your tomatoes, which also need to be pollinated by either wind or like vibrations of a bumblebee, you're gonna get a bigger yield because you're gonna be inviting this beneficial insect in that is just designed to help you with these specific plants. So. So that is a huge aspect of something that I'm planting for. I'm not only planting for my monarch butterflies, which means I have an abundance of locationally correct milkweed. You wanna make sure you're planting the milkweed that is native to your area. I'm also planting for swallowtails and other butterflies that are really endangered. So it's, it's very rewarding when you go out into what for me used to be a very barren patch of dry, parched, crabgrass, gross land full of trash, and you see all of this life in the garden. I have I've see goldfinches. I I've never saw those here before. I, I actually thought somebody's like canary escaped because I hadn't even seen one because I live in the city. So when I saw this bright yellow bird, I was like, what is that doing outside? <laughs> but you know what that bird, you know what that bird was doing outside? It was eating from the Maximilian sunflowers that I planted, which happened to be one of the things that it eats. So it's really rewarding to feel like you are directly the reason that some of these things are thriving in your area because most of the gardens around me are the astroturf and fake flowers stuck in the dirt. No, no, no judgment. So I'm going to be saving and preserving. We're going to be making jellies and teas and incense and crafts. I'm going to have dried flower arrangements that are going to look beautiful all year long, which are also going to make beautiful gifts as well. I love having the ability to like make somebody something beautiful. And when you've grown the thing that you're making it with, it's even, it's just, it's awesome. And we're almost done here because the last thing involves work, income, research, stuff like that. Because this is kind of like my job-ish, trying to find other jobs too because, you know, <laughs> times be tough. Uh, but I intend to be somewhat of a garden and plant educator for the rest of my life in some capacity. So my garden is also sort of a research garden. 
I have been taking um, notes, pretty detailed notes on varieties and things that I've tried and um, these are a lot of notes from books I've read and things like that that will eventually translate into videos, blog posts, maybe a book someday, who knows. And then finally, the last wonderful thing that goes beyond the salad that I get out of my garden is all of you. I get to make content about it. This is, let's see, I started gardening here eight years ago. I actually, I used to think it was less time, but I just had um, a Facebook memory come up, which I will uh, put here. And it was one of the first times that I started to grow things in containers outside. And that was eight years ago this year. So the last few years have been really cool being able to show you guys the stuff that I learned and uh, hopefully save you a little bit of time and mistakes along the way. So if you have been part of this journey, which has now taken me to over 20,000 subscribers, which is awesome. Thank you so very much because something I get out of my garden that I don't put in my mouth. Wait, never mind. Something I get out of my garden that isn't a salad is you. And for that, I am very grateful. So if you have watched this entire video, thank you very much. Leave me a comment down below and let me know if you're growing anything that you haven't grown before this year or for reasons you haven't grown things this year, or uh, yeah, just say hello. Extra special thanks to my patron and coffee supporters. If you wanna get involved in all of that, the info will be down below. But if not, you watching this video is thank you enough and I so appreciate all of you. I will see you in the next one. Bye.